That's it, Patrick. We've made it finally. Episode one, the road, the stage is here. Uh, I wish I could be in that studio with you. When we recorded the chat that we're about to listen to, things were a little bit different. Uh, things are a little more heightened now as far as COVID goes. So better for you and I to kind of uh, be in separate places. But uh, man, uh, uh, a lot of months worth of work coming into the road, the stage. I'm Peter Michaels, Patrick Bateman. What's going on? Um, we're very excited to finally bring this to you. Like Pete said, it's been a while and... Um... Well, we we probably have a little bit of explaining to do in terms of what this is and who's responsible, right? You know, we wanted to uh, do something for the Red Deer music scene. Red Deer music fans are passionate. Red Deer musicians are amazing. Uh, and just a little something to give back and, and better connect ourselves with the bands that tour through our city. And uh, man, we've got an unbelievable team put together to, to make this podcast happen. Yeah, so let's talk about this space, this incredible space uh, put together by producers Ryan and Riley. Uh, we're doing this long before us. Uh, we got a shout out to Brennan at Bose Bar and Stage, um, our logistics guy, as we said in our video last week. Um, and and who else? Uh, you know, we've had uh, some big help from uh, from Carolyn getting some some pictures done. That's true. A uh, shout out to Everett uh, Tates who helped us with the uh, the logo, and um, uh, our first guest as well. Which we'll get and, to in a second. And our first guest we'll get to in a second. So I think we need to send out a cheers to all these folks. I see you've got, is that the Juicy Gossip This is from the, Troubled Monk? The Juicy Gossip New England IPA. How could you not love that can? I, I also just love this beer from Troubled Monk. So shout out to them as well. Well, that's a good uh, The Road the Stage podcast beer too, right? Maybe we'll get into some Juicy Gossip with uh, a few of these guests. I think we might. What beer did you get from Troubled Monk today, sir? I've already poured myself the uh, the family colors, which I thought would be cool because, again, like I say, the Red Deer music scene is like a big family, like a big community, uh, and I thought family colors would be a good way to go. So Yeah, I also want to point out that uh, I was recently, like minutes ago, called a heathen for drinking this out of this can, so <laughs> I wonder who said that. We'll get you trained. Cheers, Patrick. Cheers to, the to everyone the involved. The Road the Stage. All right. That tastes good. So let's get into it. Um, we covered a lot of topics with Tyler Bancroft from Said the Whale in this first episode of The Road the Stage. Do we need to say anything else? I, I just Can you believe we got a Juno Award winning artist for our very first go at this? It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And we will talk to him about it. But they've got a new song out, Said the Whale's Honey Lungs. Check it out. Just, just do it after the podcast. Tyler, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be a guest here at Bose. It feels nice to be here. I can almost smell the floor. Beautiful. That's what we want. And the great food, right? The deep fried Brussels sprouts. Oh my God. The food at Bose is, um, it's a thing of legends. Bose actually is just like, it's, it's talked about um, with excited whispers among bands in Canada. Oh, you're playing Bose? Oh, yeah. So it's, it's not well, a lie, like you will circle that date on a calendar? Does that actually happen? No, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke. People, uh, you know, it first happened to us when we, we went there with Mother Mother, and, um, and a couple people texted me and said, oh, you're playing Bose? That's awesome. Get ready for the best green room spread of your life. <laughs> we're like, oh, come on. Like, we're just the support act. Like, how good can it be? We're getting, like, a couple bottles of water and 12 beers or whatever. Um, and we showed up and it's just the craziest spread. Like, yeah, it felt like the the red carpet was rolled out even for the opening band. And, um, yeah, soon learned that that was, that's just Bo's hospitality. And then the food, yeah, that's, uh, the kitchen staff there are a bunch of, bunch of award winning chefs, if you ask me. And it's so. only gotten, it's only gotten better you know, with all the, the shutdown, there's been a little bit of time to kind of reconstruct and rebuild. So the next yeah. time you guys are in it, you'll be even more blown away. I can't wait. Yeah, it truly is legendary. Bands uh, from far and wide. I mean, didn't like Jimmy World like intentionally add a stop on our tour just to play Bose because they heard about it? So I think it's because Brennan's got a Jimmy Eat World tattoo, I think is what kind of sealed He just the sent them. them the picture of the yeah. tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> don't play my bar but i don't that show it didn't, didn't happen. happen and brennan was pretty devastated about that but oh did it just get it so got it was down, supposed like, to happen in may yeah it was uh, uh it was booked bc before covid that's too bad yeah so but someday yeah. someday uh, everything will get back to some kind of new normal and uh we'll be Anyways, talking the to you point face is face. bose is legendary <laughs> everybody knows it word has spread you yeah. guys are doing a good thing. So All right, I'm and that's so the podcast. The thank you very All much right, for thanks, joining Tyler. us, Tyler. <laughs> we didn't even have to ask. 
Uh, before we get too far into things, I'm just I'm a little concerned that this is going to get busted up by the police at some point. There's a tweet from the Said the Whale account that came out last night. Just a heads up for parents to be who are stressing about the cost of a stroller. You will make up the expense by way of accidentally stolen goods. So do we have to worry a bust is coming? Yeah, listen, I'm never sure if I should, like, make the parenting tweets because, you know, we're a rock band and, like, maybe there's some version of, like, cool we're supposed to put out there. And I don't really put a lot of effort into Twitter because, um, you know, the other thing is I have kids, obviously, and Twitter is very, like, it's a, it's a space to react to political happenings. And I'm always late these days just because I got the kids and I'm, I'm doing the work thing and I'm trying to, like you know, just keep my head above water in many different avenues. So I can't always like pipe in with a hot take. Um, and so my Twitter game is really, really lacking. And so the other day I was like, man, I, I was just having this thought. I was like, okay, I'm going to tweet it. I'm just going to see it. I'm just going to tweet it and see how it feels. And it felt, it felt weird. But the point of that tweet is like, you know, I, my kids are four and a half and one and a half. I don't sleep that much. Um, you know, we're, we're still like very much in the trenches um, and uh, I I go shopping like with I got the the young one in the stroller and the other one's like walking beside me and we just like huck stuff in the bottom of the stroller and then every single time without fail I forget to pay something pay for something that's been in the bottom so yesterday I think it was like some PJ masks uh, toothpaste and like a tube of moisturizer or something like that that I didn't pay for so I got like you know seventy five percent of my goods paid for. That's pretty good. That's not that's I mean, not the worst. The time. Yeah. It's parent brain, and if you run into a cop or a security agent who's also a parent, they're gonna be like, It's fine. It's, we get it. I feel like they'd let it slide. They'd let it slide. Yeah. So speaking parent, of having parents, kids, I think parents are doing God's work, so the the last time I saw you guys was at the Field Day Festival in uh, Edmonton, so which would have been late twenty nineteen. So I think that was just before your second was born, right? Um No, it was, was it right, right around after, the same actually. right after, okay. It was right after, yeah. Yeah, so I I was allowed out of the house there for a minute to go play that festival and then straight back home to the chaos. So we want to talk a lot about uh, touring and, and the stuff that you guys have been through over the years, but specifically, how has it changed with kids? Like, do you end up missing or or um, having to, you know, book tours and look and go, you know what, it's uh, so-and-so's birthday that day, we can't do a show that day. Like, how does it... No, you know, I mean, birthdays... Um... It's just a day, you know. I, I missed my son's third birthday to play a festival in Peterborough, um, so I like Facetimed him from stage. It was cute. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's changed in that like I don't think that we're gonna be going out for like the six week runs. Um, we do, but yeah, I mean, we kind of we didn't do any before work families and stuff, um, but we do our best. Um, or we, you know, before all this happened, we were doing our best to try and keep things to like two, two and a half, three weeks tops, come home for a little, little refresh and then go back out. Um, so yeah, it's, um, you know, we, we do our best to navigate the families, but it's also our job. So, um, you know, you can only, you can only do so much, you know, you, you can't just be going home every, every second because it just becomes totally um, it's just not economical. So, um, it's, it's a very, de- it's a delicate balancing act. Let's put it that way. Would you consider taking them on the road with you for hell no? Sure? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you guys have kids? You know what? We, nope. we, 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 I've got three and we decided to drive to Disneyland. The youngest would have been six. So we were six, eight and 10 when yeah. we did that first long trip and we swore never again. And then somehow a year or two later, we ended up doing it again. Good for you, man. That's awesome. I mean, my, my kids are a little younger, so um, it's just not even a consideration. I feel like, you know, if they were like seven and ten, we could get, we could do like a couple days. I could work. The problem is, is just like, it it doesn't work for you know. You have to have help. Like I'd have to bring my partner with me, and um, and then she just it would end up being like babysitter the whole time. So it wouldn't be fun for her. It wouldn't be fun for me. And um, you know, like. Bad time these days, like seven o'clock, even if they're a bit older, like what is it, eight, nine, like as they get older. Um, I'm barely on stage by then. So, you know, like what good am I? It's uh, it's not a lifestyle conducive to children. There are people that do it though. Um, you know, the first time that we toured with stars, um, Amy uh, had her little one and she was, so she was like just over two and they had hired a nanny um, 
for for the tour and, and Amy as the singer in the band obviously and Evan as the bass player um, and so they're the parents they're out like doing all the, all the stuff and then um, and then I guess they you know they do bedtime while the opening act is on and then uh, and then the nanny took over and um, yeah it, it was it was pretty chaotic and, and at the time I didn't have kids so I kind of had no idea what they were even going through but looking back on it I think wow that that was uh, a pretty power move on their part Sounds like a lot. And a lesson learned, I think, as well. And you're hitting the stage, I'm assuming, with a completely different mentality of you've got kids waiting for you just around the corner or wherever they may, may be. The thing is, too, and, and what I didn't realize in looking back on it, you know, it's like your kid wakes up at like six, seven, if you're lucky. Right. So, like, you know, you're in a band and, like, you know, Amy and Evan get, get off stage at like 12 or 1, kind of get all that thing done. And you go home and you just get like just a second to sleep and then you wake up with your kid. So it's not like, you know, the rest of your tour bus is just sleeping until 1 p.m. kind of thing. But so, um, the rock star lifestyle and the parenting lifestyle are very polar opposite. <laughs> last I checked, and I might have it wrong, but in 2019, before everything shut down, I think you had your last shows before COVID in December of 2019. Yeah. And then yeah. you were in Alberta at least three times that I could find in that year alone. Is that normal mm -hmm. for you guys to be, you know, in your neighboring province that, that much in one year? Um, yeah, I think so. You know, there's, uh, there's festival season, there's our own shows. We're on cycle too. So it makes a difference when you have a record to promote. Yeah. Um, you know, I, we love playing, uh, you know, the, the Calgary, Alberta, Red Deer cycle. It's great. Um, you know, it's um, it's not close. You gotta you gotta fill it in on the way there, unless you didn't fly ins. But um, yeah, it, I mean, I I miss that whole thing that we used to do, <laughs> getting on airplanes <laughs> and playing shows. It was good. So would it typically be festivals that you fly into then, or you know, if you're let's say you're starting to tour out east, you'll fly out east and then work your way back with a vehicle. We often do that, yeah. Um, you know, there was a time when we would we would drive five days straight from Vancouver to Toronto and then and then tour back, um, but we try not to do that anymore for so many reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's a combination of, of flying and driving and, and just kind of whatever makes sense economically and um, just you know time investment wise. Now, was there anything uh, as a kid? Did you get used to travel? Like, did you guys do lots of vacations and, and lots of traveling, or how did you get yourself kind of accustomed to that? Rogue yeah, lifestyle. I mean, it, it's it's a totally different kind of traveling, band traveling. Um, you know, like sure, like I grew up like doing road trips and camping and all that stuff, and then you know in my twenties I did a lot of traveling, um, and and I love that, and and I love you know adventuring, I love exploring other countries and other cultures and stuff. That's I definitely have the travel bug, um, and touring does not scratch that itch at all. Um, it is, you're just like to a schedule, you got to be where you got to be. Like you have a little bit of time to explore, but even then you're kind of like, you know, tethered to this other thing and people need you. And, um, so it's a, it's a very different kind of traveling. I do, I love it. I, I enjoy it. And, and it's, um, I love that moving around is a thing I get to do in my profession. Um, and, and it honestly is one of the things I miss most from the before times is just being on the go all the time. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not at all like traveling. I was reading, um, an article from, I think his name is Josh Lucas with the, the Georgian Strait, I think is, is the publication, but he, yeah. he wrote, uh, he kind of labeled you as the business manager of the band. Is that, would you, would you consider that the truth? He, sorry, he did what with the business manager? He, he labeled you as kind of the business manager. You, you handle the dealings of the band. Is that, is that on tour as well? Are you kind of the, uh, the tour guide? Um, so I do manage the band, yeah. um, as like an overarching, uh, artist official manager. title. Yeah, um, yeah. I, on tour though, we hire a tour manager and, and most acts will have, they've got like the regular manager, like in whatever city, like that's not on tour with them. Um, and then you hire a tour manager and that's the person that makes up your daily schedule, make sure everybody needs to be where they need to be. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a very difficult job. <laughs> it's very involved. I imagine you guys are probably a little easier to wrangle nowadays than you would have been in the early days of the band. You know what? We've never been hard to wrangle. We're a pretty wrangleable crew. Um, most people are in good communication. You know, nobody's like a crazy party animal. Um, we like to party, but it's it's never like out of control. It's just you know 
Um, it's it's in a we're, we're a pretty tight knit group, and I, I put us in like the more responsible category uh, of bands. And you learn those lessons along the way. So I did. I watched the the Winning America documentary again last night just to kind of refresh. Oh, nice. And yeah. uh, it's, I mean, uh, there's so many great things about that documentary. Can but we of get course... more easy access to it? By the way, like we had to go <laughs> yeah. to the depths of the internet to watch that documentary. I think that would be a really? good that would yeah. be a good Patreon uh, thing is to have like a good clean version of that somewhere for people to that's read. a great idea i'm gonna write that down on my phone right now. <laughs> yeah i don't know why it's not like on an official website because it's really really well done it's fantastic thank you. okay i'm just writing winning america for patreon okay thank you for that idea great. so the the one scene i'm thinking of there though is is right towards the end of the south by southwest and i mean how do you not live it up while you're down there um but you get uh you get uh, a little crazy towards the end and have a, a rough time with those last couple of shows so, I mean, how do you balance yeah. that? You know, you're out there, you're doing your thing, you want to be the rock stars, you want to live it up a little bit, but you've also got to protect the toolbox and, and you guys have a job to do while you're there. That's the thing. Um, and I think like me in particular, I don't have a very robust voice. Um, ben has a very strong voice and, and he can last a bit more than, than I can um, with, with going out and stuff. Um, but you know, for both of us, and I think any artist will tell you this, who, who has to sing as a part of their job, um, it is, it's not, it's not singing the shows every night that gets you, it's yelling over music every single time. And, and, you know, on that documentary, you know, we were in the process of learning that lesson. Um, and now we just don't do it. Um, you know, we'll go out, but if the bar that we're at is playing super loud music, and we got to play a show within any span of two days. We'll find a different bar. Um, you know, we we like we like to put them back. We like to drink and we love beers and all that stuff. But um, but like I will take six beers in a hotel room over six beers in any bar just because I can have a conversation with a normal volume. Um, so that's really all it's about. Um, it's just shouting over music. That is the most taxing thing on your voice. You lose your voice instantly. So that was a, yeah, that was a lesson we learned that time in Austin. And, um, and ever since then we, we'll party, but we like to keep it close to home, baby. Well, it's a good <laughs> lesson to learn in, uh, in your first time at South by in Austin. I mean, that, that one scene of you guys at night, it looked like you could have been at Mardi Gras. Like it was yeah. madness. <laughs> It's a wild scene there, and I love it. You know, I I love that buzz, and and it's exciting. Um, and you can still do that. You don't have to shut over music like we did. You know, we we took it too far, and and you know we're, um, yeah. I mean, we're having a good time, and and um, and in those situations, it's just impossible to not like be talking to people. But there are also ways of speaking uh, when you're at bars, uh, and loud music is happening. You can kind of train yourself to like to. Um, to like raise the pitch of your voice so that it cuts through sound a bit more. You can use earplugs and that makes you shout less. So if you're wearing earplugs, you're just going to kind of like, people just have to lean in to hear you. So you don't have to like change the volume, uh, the volume of your voice to, to make yourself heard. You just speak your normal voice and you're good. So there are, there are some tips that can get you through the night uh, unscathed. Now, before we move on from that doc, which again, uh, keep your eyes on the said the whale patreon for the possibility of seeing because it is like really really awesome i i enjoyed watching it very much i learned a lot about you, you guys and we'll talk about the new song later but I, I was excited to see that you've brought you you at least to some extent brought back your old drummer to play drums on this new song that's right yeah so spencer uh departed the band officially i guess in um, I want to say it was 2016 or something like that. Right. Um, and uh, and so we we rebranded as as a three piece. Uh, the, the old bass player left too. Um, and uh, but it, you know it was never for for spiteful reasons. There was never any um, any tension, any more tension than is normal to have tension uh, in, in in a rock band with five people. Um, so uh, I mean he left just because life on the road is is crazy you know like we were just talking about before you're always on the go you but you always have the schedule to adhere to it's just not a very good lifestyle for settling into like good habits and um and you know if you want to just kind of lead a, a a simple life which which spencer is very much into um don't go on tour don't be in a band that tours um so that was his reason for leaving it was never anything um anything serious or anything more than that so Right, and um, but he he's got to be one of the only musicians to have a tour experience which involved uh, a bottle of mustard 
being sprayed at you and not in a good way, whatever that way might be. Is there a good way to have mustard sprayed? There's, there's got to sure. be. Well, there's the dumb there's and the dumber man. thing where they're trying to, you know, calm down from the hot sauce. I mean, that's kind of fun. There's, being there's a, a but, being a, but being attacked. Yeah, attacked with a bottle of attacked mustard. Attacked with mustard. Yeah. And if you're listening, of course, these guys are referring to a, an incredible scene from a documentary <laughs> where Spencer was accosted by an angry woman. Perhaps the of- worst condiment to be attacked with, actually. Now that Spencer I think actually it. really likes mustard. I do so, too, but I don't want to be sprayed with it. <laughs> that was his reasoning. He was upset. <laughs> but, um, anyway, so you know, we're we're still tight with Spenny. We you know we see we catch up with him when we can, and um, and uh, you know I think under normal circumstances we probably would have flown out um, our touring drummer Brad uh, to play these songs just because it's nice to have you know your crew that's going on tour with you uh, having played on the record. Um, that's just kind of a nice feeling for everybody. Um, but, um, but yeah, we, you know, COVID happened, no travel and Spencer was around and he was super stoked to do it. And, um, I mean, the truth is nobody plays like Spencer. He is a monster behind the kit. And, uh, and yeah, on, on that new tune, Honey Lungs, he, I got a lot of comments like, man, who's playing the drums? It's like, who do you think is playing the drums? It's Spencer. And people are like, ah, that makes sense. Okay. He's just like he puts drum fills in places where most drummers would not put drum fills. That's like one way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, no, the drumming is very, very cool on that new yeah. track. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad to hear that he was on there, and and I, I just I, I don't know that that mustard scene just got me. I just need it. Like there, I'm assuming there was no proper resolution. It was just no. uh, another day on the road. We'll move on from this. Another day on the road. Definitely a strange day on the road, yeah. but. One of yeah. many, I'm sure. You know, one of the things that I, I admire a lot about your band, and it comes through with, you know, the new material you're putting out now, but just you can put a positive spin on just about anything. Like in that documentary, right, you guys have the trailer broken into in Sacramento. You have instruments, clothing, everything goes missing. Uh, and you guys film a reenactment scene, all jumping around and joyful around that. The mustard scene happens. And I forget, uh, I think it was Ben that was talking to the cop afterwards and said, you know what, how can we be mad? Look at what's all around us. Um, how, like, how do you guys maintain that positivity? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, thank you for saying that. It's a nice thing. Uh, it's a nice reputation to have. Um, and, and I think it's true. I think that, like, you know, while I will say everybody has their dark moments, especially on tour, because it can be, uh, it can really beat you down. Um, for the most part, we're a positive group of people. Um, you know, we have fairly sunny outlooks on life. Um, we enjoy each other's company. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's just, it just feels better to be hopeful. And I think, you know, being in a band, you learn that early on. And maybe that's the only thing that keeps people in bands is hope. Um, because you're always sort of like, you're chasing a dream in a sense, you know, like, um, we're, we're a pretty blue collar band. You know, I, I wouldn't describe us as having made it in any sense of the word or not, not, not in any sense of the word, but you know, we, we work hard for the money that we earn, which is not much. And, um, and enjoy it. Like, uh, you know, the hope and our, the belief in our art, um, being as a, it us going. And so when bad things happen, which they do happen to bands all the time. You start out in a band and bad things happen. People say no, people hate your music. And so you kind of like, you develop this, um, you know, you can either develop a really thick skin and it can, it can kind of uh, manifest itself in this, in this grumpy, grumpy vibe. Or, um, or you do this sort of like water off a duck's back thing and you try and turn the other cheek and find ways to, uh, to embrace the good things that are happening and the positive things that happen. Um, and those are more fun to be a part of a, as a group, it's, it's more fun to be a part of, of, of a group of people who react positively to things. Um, and I think for listeners and for people who are watching the band, it's also more fun just to be a part of a positive experience in general. It may not be like as salacious or, um, or like sexy as it could be. Maybe if we are a bunch of like, you know, grumpy drug addicts, um, 
but I think that for the average person, it's a more enjoyable all around experience. I like that description of a potential band. Like, oh, who'd you see last night? Ah, don't. They're just a bunch of grumpy drug addicts. It was pretty good. <laughs> it's you know what? It's funny because I don't know any bands like that. I like I literally I'm saying that's like a cliche, like oh whatever, like old school thing. But every band that I've ever come across for the most part, um, have not been addicted to anything and have been very positive, happy people. You know, I think that people who are successfully making music for a living or starting to eke out a world for themselves in, in that profession, um, but yeah, there's a certain personality type that you, that you kind of got to have, um, or at least, you know, be surrounding yourself in that, in that, um, in, in, with with people who have those personalities, um, because it, it can get dark quick if uh, if you don't. And I, you know, I know a lot of people who who struggle with that as well. Um, so uh, I think it's um, it's all it's good to acknowledge the dark times too. You know, it's it isn't all sunshine and roses, and there are a lot of difficult things about being in a band and and touring all the time and stuff. And I imagine that uh, people are going to come out of this pandemic with um, with new ways of doing things and and new ways of approaching their touring, perhaps, that um, that are more healthy than they used to be. And probably a little more appreciation as well. Like, again, you know, uh, Patrick yeah. alluded to the fact that you guys were here three times in 2019. Uh, I saw all three of those shows, right? So you guys opened for Mother Mother at Bose, uh, mm-hmm. which I believe was their Oh My Heart tour. And then... Uh, no, 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 it, it was the... Or was uh, that the No Culture? It, it, it was uh, Dance and Cry. Dance and Cry, that's right. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. So it was okay. the Dance and Cry tour, and then again, I saw you at Field Day, which was, I think, sometime in September, and then October, you were back on the yeah. Cascadia tour here uh, yeah. at Bose. So, yeah, I, I don't know if it, it like, I'm, I'd be very hesitant to say, like, people will be more appreciative of it, just because, you know, when I think of the people I know who struggle with their mental health on the road... Um, it doesn't mean they're not appreciative. It just means that it's a really, really difficult job to have. Um, And um, so, you know, maybe a year at home will have helped those people learn some new coping mechanisms, but maybe not. You know, I I think that always artists are appreciative of the lifestyle that they get to lead, Um, but always it's going to be a struggle for for a lot of people. Um, Speaking of adapting, like... Or, uh, if the, if you could do the pandemic over again, if you had a redo, <laughs> oh Jesus, um, what is this some kind of fucking <laughs> scenario you're running through? If me? you want to lay down on a couch real quick, uh, if you had a redo, would you guys do anything different? Like it seems like you guys adapted to the pandemic situations pretty well. Yeah, I, I feel good about it. Um, <clears throat> you know, personally, the most difficult thing for me was. Was and is because we're still in it. Let's remember, you yep. know, it's not over at all. In mm-hmm. fact, you know, BC's numbers are the worst they've ever been. Um, so while we're all sitting here waiting for our vaccines, um, you know, we still got to be got to be careful. I I like just got a cold today, like for the first time ever. Um, so you know, stuff gets passed around. Um, anyways, um, yeah, I, I feel good about the way that our that our band reacted, and oh yeah, what, what I was just saying is, for me personally, it was it was um, more difficult to find to find free time than ever before, um, just because uh, you know, especially at the beginning, all of our childcare was gone. Um, you know, we all of a sudden, all you know, our routines all got totally disrupted, and um, and so that made everything a lot more difficult. You know, it was really hard to find time to write music. It was. Um, you know, I had to kind of like claw for every every studio day to um, to figure out you know how we're gonna gonna have the kids taken care of and stuff. Um, so so personally, I'm happy to to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel and and get back to to some social activities that take the pressure off of parenting. Um, but um, yeah, professionally, I feel great about it. You know, I think that we. We kind of waited it out a little bit to do the online shows just because we weren't really sure how long we were all going to be in this for. Um, and then decided to go for it. And it was an incredible experience. And honestly, I think that the online shows that we did uh, and will continue to do throughout the course of this pandemic have been so galvanizing for our fan base. And, you know, from those shows, you know, emerged a Facebook group called Said Heads where 
you know, these people, like, they organize their own uh, postcard exchange. They're, like, becoming actual friends with each other. And, like, um, and there's a Discord that, that you get to be a part of. And, and if you don't know what Discord is, it's, like, this online chat community. It's kind of like a private chat bot that you set up little, like, communities. Um, and uh, so there's a, a Discord where, where the said heads go. And they just, like, chat amongst themselves. And every now and again, me and Ben and Jace kind of go in and, like, pipe in on whatever. And, like, they don't even care that we're there we are not at all a, the reason that those people are there. They're there because they have a common interest, which is they like our music. But more than that, they've just, you know, created these friendships. Um, and I, I don't think that necessarily would have happened if we um, hadn't done the online shows uh, through COVID. That's beautiful. That's such a, such a cool positive. That's what, honestly yeah, what it's about, right? Music builds community. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Yeah, and I, it's it's been pretty incredible to watch over the past year. I I never could have predicted that. It's funny because early on in the pandemic, when we were you know watching how the scene was playing out and how shows were being canceled and how bands were adapting to it, it's funny that you mention uh, almost spreading things out because it was in those first few weeks of the pandemic. It seemed like every band was like, "All right, we've got two live stream shows today. We're going to make the next two weeks a blast, and then we'll all be back to normal." And here we are, a year yeah. later. <laughs> yeah, it's. I'm sure you could pull up some pretty good tweets from around that time that um, yep. that <laughs> nobody really saw what was coming. Um, but yeah, man, it it was exhausting for a while there. Like every second, somebody was doing an Instagram live, and we were kind of like, okay, we tried to do it a little bit, and it didn't didn't quite feel right. Um, and then it was Dan Mangan actually that convinced us to do a show through his platform, Side Door. Um, so we did a show on Zoom, and Zoom was what changed everything for us. Um, being able to see people, um, having this like, you know, community interactive experience, not just sort of like looking at your phone and not knowing who's there. Um, that was, yeah, that was the real game changer for us. Cause yeah, I felt like it was just like stream exhaustion for the first month or so. It's just another evolution of your relationship, your, your, um, unique ideas to be intimate with your fans. Like I was reading yesterday about that boat show that you did. Um, right from, you know, harbor to harbor in, in Vancouver. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's this is the next evolution of that is sitting in an online lobby, just hanging out, being able to see the faces of however many fans. Pretty cool. I know. I hope that people still want to go to shows after this because <laughs> they people are getting pretty used to just like chilling at home. <laughs> And, and the food the, is cheaper. The drinks are cheaper. The experience is pretty good. The experience, um, the, the personal connection, right? Like that's... The, the one thing that I've found is, you know, you're doing it with through the Patreon, you're doing Zoom meetings with fans, right? So yeah. it's, you know, normally it's, you know, lucky folks like us that get to do these interviews and, and kind of get close and personal with you guys. But now the fans have all of that opportunity right in front of them. That's a good point. Yeah, the access has definitely increased a lot. Um, that's that's been a very interesting thing to watch, um, you know. Um, I mean, we've always been an accessible band. Uh, you know, I'm pretty active on social media and stuff like that. But, but yeah, this is this is leveled up for sure. Um, you know, those you're mentioning those those monthly Patreon hangs. For anybody who's in the ten dollar plus a month subscription level, they get a, a Zoom link to a, a monthly hang we've been doing. Play a couple songs. Honestly, mostly just like chat, just like chit chat about whatever, and it's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's very. I when I think back to like you know, artists that I was really into as a young person um, or, or you know, just as a person who wasn't in the music industry at the time. Um, being able to do that with an artist that you're really into is pretty crazy, you know. I couldn't ever even tweet at somebody that I thought was great. I just had to go to the show and, like, scream. Yeah, or ambush them outside the back door of the venue. Mm -hmm. No, no need to yeah. do that anymore. Yeah, I remember like waiting, waiting for Dave Grohl outside a Foo Fighters concert, and like he was there, but like I couldn't get close enough. But, yeah, pretty nuts. <laughs> so with the world being as crazy it is over this last year, and to go back to the theme of positivity with uh, with the band, um, you know, we've got all the, you know, not just the pandemic, but all the incidents of the last year. Uh, mm. You guys come out with a song with honey in your lungs and full of empathy, and uh, again, put that positive spin on where the world is at right now. Talk a little bit about uh, the new tune and where things are going. 
Yeah, totally. Um, the tune. So, I mean, the the very beginnings of the tune are are funny. It, it was this really, really janky demo that Ben had made, and it was just like him, like boom bapping on a desk with like this nasty beat and these kind of like little guitar riffs that that you know kind of got stuck in my head. And he was mumbling the lyrics and. Um, and the lyric was actually, um, I always wanted to be Tom Waits. That was the first lyric. Um, and he'd kind of like produced his demo in, in this like really like Tom Waitsy kind of like, like hardly listenable kind of thing. But it was, it was really charming. And it had so much character to it that I was like, okay, that's the demo that I think we should work on. Let's try and like, let's just try and write the song in the studio. Um, and so his little guitarist kind of inspired that. Um, that little walk down riff that happens off off the top of the song and is like the hook of the song, um, and um, and yeah, the honey lungs that just kind of came to us as we were writing it um, in Steve Bay's backyard next to the fire, and um, that was honey in your lungs was um, does admittedly sound a bit gross, <laughs> like you have like a really nasty cold, but that's not what it is at all. Um, that was meant to be, yes, you know, sweetness in, in the things you're saying and, um, you know, approaching situations with, with empathy and understanding and, um, and trying your best not to like default to defensiveness, which, um, you know, especially in the past year with a lot of heavy conversations happening online, is um, something that you see a lot where people's gut reaction is to assume that somebody is saying something maliciously or, or hateful and, um, and reacting in that way, and then it kind of spirals out of control. Um, and, you know, it happens on both sides. Like, if you want to talk about, like, uh, left, right, whatever, um, you know, the way that people interact with each other online is not the way you would ever speak to somebody in real life. It's not even crazy. close. Not even close. Um, yeah, uh, and and it can be really upsetting to watch, and it's upsetting to be a part of too. Because you know, if you're if you're part, if you're participating in some of these conversations, um, and you read the things that people will write back to you, um, it's like they haven't even heard anything you've said, or you know, nuance is lost in in written language on the internet. Um, and so that's really what it was about. It's just about you know trying to trying to assume the best in people. Um, and that doesn't mean not standing up for what you believe in or not, um, you know, being anti-racist or um, anti any of those things. It just means trying to approach all the situations with kindness. And that's all it is. I certainly hope that, you know, the sentiment in that one verse with the uh, knee pressed on the throat of a man um, becomes a less relevant lyric in years to come. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, I mean that. That so that's the thing. You know, we were writing this song right after the death of George Floyd, and that's obviously what that lyric refers to. And uh, I remember when we came up with that lyric, we're just like, "Oh man, like, can we say this in a song? Is this is this too much?" Um, but then it just felt okay um, because it just felt like something that should be referenced, and you know, we're not like. Um, yeah, we're not trying to like cash in on anything that's happened. Um, and, you know, I think the message of the song is, is positive and, and that was it, what it was about for us. But um, yeah, God, police violence against black people is out of control and it still is. And I hope that uh, a new presidency in the States fixes that. I hope that, um, you know, the situation in Canada improves too with violence towards indigenous people. Um, it's, it's a problem everywhere. And, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it has to do with, uh, we don't need to get into it. Archaic policing systems, all this kind of stuff. It's, um, I think it starts at least the thing that we can do is just by spreading kindness. That's, the, that's the power that we have as songwriters is to put out positive messages into the world and hope that that connects with enough people that, um, Maybe someone will just, um, you know, approach one situation differently one day, and, and that can be our contribution. With a little more empathy. Totally. Or a lot more, in some cases. A lot, a lot more, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, while we're on lyric references, I do have to bug you about one more. Uh, with Emerald Lake uh, AB, I'll push the Jimmy if you push the Dave. Can we get some clarifications on the Jimmys and Daves we're talking about here? Sure. Okay, yeah. So first of all, let me also mention that 
um, for the Alberta folks, this this song is a funny one because the song is actually not about Emerald Lake um, because Emerald Lake is in British Columbia. Right. We were on tour. We thought that we were at Emerald Lake because we were just looking. We didn't even know what lake we were at. We, yeah, we were yeah. just looking back and it was like, were we at Emerald Lake? Where was it? I think it was Emerald Lake. Let's call it that. And we we're definitely in Alberta, right? Let's okay. Let's say let's say it's that. Um, so that was how the song got titled. Turns out we we're in Johnson Lake, Alberta. Oh, okay. So if you ever want to relive our experience, it's Johnson Lake. It's a beautiful <laughs> lake. I totally recommend it. Um, anyways, we were on tour with a band called Hey Ocean, which is a Vancouver-based uh, pop Great band. Great band, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we kind of cut our teeth with those guys um, in in the scene here. Did a lot of shows with them, and yeah, did this incredible uh, summer tour with them. Uh, and uh, so Dave, so Dave could either be Dave Beckingham or Dave Vertesi. There's okay. two Daves in the band. And then Jimmy was like, for some reason, the nickname of their drummer, Dan. His name's Dan. And he's a, a, a great record producer who works out of White Rock and soon to be Pender Island in British Columbia here. Um, and um, yeah, an incredible kind of like jazzy, funky drummer. Um, but his name is not Jimmy, it's Dan. There you go. Okay. All right. Some, some deep <laughs> trivia. Yeah. Lyrical secrets revealed. Um, t- talking about the touring with Hey Ocean, I can't remember. I-, I think you guys were on the bill together. Do you remember playing the Shake the Lake Festival in Sylvan Lake? Oh back yeah, back in about yeah. 2011. Okay, mm-hmm. I actually I I, I had told uh, the mayor of Sylvan Lake, who's Sean McIntyre, uh, who booked him and his brother Edward were the guys that put that uh, festival on. Was yeah, Sean now is the mayor. the mayor. Yeah, Sean's the mayor now. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, like, yeah, I've been exchanging social media chit chats with sean forever is sean like rochelo or something uh mcintyre oh mcintyre so oh okay oh yeah, yeah no, I, yeah. I still i treat with him yeah for sure yeah sean and his um, brother ed uh, put that festival together so and i mean it just it had such a big impact uh you know he became a fan after seeing you guys and i think hey ocean was on the bill or maybe hey ocean had headlined it the year after i can't remember but i know that at, so after that show we went back uh, we went back to Red Deer, and it was our first time ever being in Red Deer. And we went to some karaoke bar. We did karaoke. We got really wasted. Um, and then some guy at the bar was like, I won the lottery. Shots for everybody. So he like <laughs> bought everybody... He brought everybody Jameson shots. and No, no, no. It was like Jack Daniels, like the bottom shelf JD. And I remember just being like, Bullshit, you won the lottery. If you won the lottery, we'd be drinking from the top shelf, <laughs> not this whatever swill you're passing out now. And anyways, it was, uh, that, that's my, my one memory from Red Deer. Do we have a top shelf in Red Deer? I thought everything was bottom shelf. Yeah, I don't know you, if top you shelf on, has made it here yet. You were, on the no, you were on the north end for sure, probably. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that was it. Maybe maybe that was just my like big city boy being like, get me a fancy highball <laughs> because you won the lottery. But really, it's like, no, this is, I really won the lottery. Maybe he did. I don't know. And that was 2011? Like, you no, know, if you win the lottery, though, you shouldn't go to a bar and tell everyone you just won the lottery. No, no. What's well, one of the last places you should do that? Yeah, that's like rule one, is you keep it to yourself. Yeah, I want to say 2011 was the year that Shake the Lake festival. Sounds about right. Did, did you, guys, you guys know that was a long time ago? That was, <laughs> yeah, that was actually 10 years, 10 ago. years ago now? Absolutely yeah. insane. Just crazy, because you, you, like, you guys are approaching, uh, well, at least 15 years, right? Um, not quite. It, so we, we, call 20, we call 2007 our band birth, and May 15th is our band birthday, because the, our first like, ever record release show that we played at the Media Club in Vancouver for our record, Islands, or sorry, uh, Taking Abalonia before it was a, a combo record with another album, um, was May 15th, 2007. So in, in a couple months, we'll be turning 14. Damn. If my math is I right. think so, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 So moving forward into uh, 2021, uh, how do you guys decide to release the song now? Like, I mean, the, the touring stuff is still up in the air. I know you guys have dates booked for this summer, actually one here in Alberta again at the Pigeon Lake uh, Festival in August. But everything's yeah. still so uncertain. So how do you determine now is the time to start releasing stuff? Yeah, we just didn't want to wait anymore. Um, and, you know, I think that, like... Coming out of this whole thing, you want to be one of the bands that was active. And, and I feel good about how active we were in terms of like fan engagement and the online shows and stuff. Um, but we had this, you know, we're sitting on these songs and, you know, the record's not even done yet. 
Um, but and we're gonna keep working on it. But I think that it is the time to release the music and you know to build towards a record. And I think you know in a perfect world the record comes out sometime in the fall and maybe we're touring by early to 2022. Um, honestly, just like we're, we're it's all a moving target right now because. Um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be pretty messed up for, I'd say, over a year once touring starts again, just in terms of bottleneck and, you know, yeah. getting getting the dates, venue availabilities are going to be difficult. There are a lot less venues than there were before, um, unfortunately, obviously. It's been very hard on those businesses. Um, so it's it's going to be a weird situation for touring for quite some time. Um, but, um, but, you know, you can't stop it from letting you release music, even though... It is tricky because it's very. It's way more difficult to monetize it. You know, like every we've everyone's had the streaming discussion and and what that yields for artists. Um, you know, it's being out on the road promoting your new single that gets you paid playing shows. Um, so that is the part we miss, and it's certainly weird having just put out a song and now all we're gonna do is like yell into the void about it like repeatedly. Um, uh, so you know. It's strange, but it had to be done. Well, you guys, I mean, you you waited a year. Like, uh, you're you're on good track, I think. Yeah, yeah, and we wanted to wait till we had enough songs to feel confident that like there would be a record, uh, and, and I do feel confident. Um, so, um, yeah, it's it's going to be a fun rollout. I think it's it's going to be a lot of just kind of like song by song and song and song and song and song, and then when the time is right, there will be a record. But I th I think what we'll try and do now is just kind of consistently release music um you know every four to eight weeks or something like that and and you know be on, be at the front of people's minds so as we know the touring makes the money it's not there right now so maybe to talk a little bit more about the patreon how you guys decided to get involved in that was there any uh hesitations or trepidations worried about geez we're you know here with our hands out again with our, our fans already do so much for us yeah i and that's exactly it man i do not like begging. I I don't really like talking about money, to be honest. You know, I was, I was raised not to talk about money. I, I try and steer clear of the Spotify discussions because I it's just not really my thing uh, to to be uh, complainy. Um, not that the artists who are like fighting for for proper compensation are com are complaining. So uh, I take back what I said, actually. Um, but uh, anyways, yeah, I I never like to be hat in hand and. And I, I felt like that's what Patreon could be misunderstood as. Um, so I went to the said heads Facebook group and I had a like pretty frank discussion with the people there. I just said, listen, you know, we're thinking of doing a Patreon. Um, we've got a lot of, um, you know, we've got over a hundred scraps of demos and unfinished songs. And so these are things we could share through this Patreon. There's, you know, a lot of extra things we could do for you if that was of interest to you. Um, and we want it to be, we want it to provide value to you and not just feel like this, um, you know, monthly charity thing that's happening. Um, and, uh, so we, we were met with overwhelming, yes, please do it. This sounds awesome. And, um, yeah, we're at 200 subscribers now. It's great. Um, there's a little bit of cash in the bank every month for us that we can fall back on. So it's a nice little safety net. Um, you know, to, to keep the business running because, you know, we're, we're a small business and we've got operating expenses like every other small business. Um, so that definitely provides a little bit of a cushion. And, um, and more than that, it's just been, it's been awesome. The interactions we've got to have, uh, for people, um, at the very top level of the subscription, we're writing out or doing handwritten lyrics for the song of your choice. And, um, and that's been like a really, I didn't expect to feel emotional about that, but, it's actually really amazing to be like writing out these lyrics that I wrote however many years ago for somebody who has asked me to do that. And then I, you know, Jace packs it up. We put it in the mail um, and send it off to this person that is like paying every month to, to, to get stuff from our band and to feel connected to our band. And it's, um, it's been a really awesome experience. I just feel like more connected to our fans than ever before. I understand that hesitation to, you know, build that subscription based service. But at the same time, you've you, like this whole reason, this whole way, this method of interacting with fans has been taken away from you in the first place. You can't sell them a shirt 
or vinyl or sell them your 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 music, your performance at a show throughout the year. So I think it's a pretty good uh, uh, replacement. And I, I think that across all sorts of Patreons and crowdfunding and th- subscription services that I've seen, like uh, I've never seen anyone complain that they don't get enough out of it, right? It's a more personal experience. Again, you go back to the conversation we had about, you know, uh, the, the connections that we would have with the bands that we grew up. We, we, we yeah. were killed to have this. And I would yeah. have paid any amount of money back in the late 80s, early 90s to, to have a Zoom call with Kurt or Dave or, you know, Ed, any of those guys, right? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I think at first I was feeling hesitant uh, or like not worthy or something like that. But um, yeah, when I look at it now, it, it's awesome. Like, you know, we are, we're providing a lot of value for people and, you know, the people on the Patreon got to hear Honey Lungs four days before it came out. Um, they're going to get to see the music video three or four days before it comes out. Um, so, um, which is March 31st, by the way. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a great thing. I, I highly recommend it for any band at any level and, and uh, I'm so glad that we made that decision. So you're telling me you didn't coin the term said heads? That hasn't been floating around for a decade now? I did not come up with it, but I had like heard it. Like a few people had kind of thrown it around a little bit. And then I think I said it on one of our Zoom shows and somebody latched onto it. And then that's how the group got started. But I don't take credit for, for coining that term. But it's new. Like it's a new term. It, has, it didn't exist 10 years ago. No, I swear I heard it like ten years ago. Okay, Somebody okay. said it, but but I, you know, I just wasn't. I don't know. I it it just it stuck with me, but I never like I never like placed it upon anybody. It's almost too perfect. It is, but uh, the thing is, like, I don't like the Grateful Dead, and I think a lot of people don't <laughs> like the Grateful Dead. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, <laughs> had, like, that's where I, I think maybe that's where my hang up was initially with it. I was just like, it's like so lame. Um, but, um, but deadheads are cool, man. Like I do know a couple deadheads and they're cool people. So so. sweet that, that, that's, that is like, to me, some of those, I've been to a few Dave Matthews band, you know, type of weekend festivals. And like, there, there is an amazing sense of positivity in those, those music communities. That's just the thing. Yeah. I mean, the music may not be for me, but, um, all the people, like, I feel like they would welcome you with open arms and that's the said heads are like that too. Anytime there's a new member in, in the Facebook group or in the discord, um, they get met with, with nothing but positive vibes and, and good welcomes. And it's, it's amazing. So join, join the discord at the very well, least to, to get on the discord. You got to be a patron. There we go. Um, but, but you can join the Facebook group, uh, with, with no subscription required. Such a good name, said heads. I, I'm going to be a said head now. I, Welcome to the crew, man. Thanks, man. I am Happy. a total said head, especially again after you know watching Winning America again and just yeah. again seeing the trials and tribulations and just the positivity that you guys spread. I don't see how anybody wouldn't want to be anything yeah, other than awesome. a said head. And someday, someday, I don't know what that day will be, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see you on stage again at Bose. Right, I think it's we gonna can... happen. I can like I can picture it all in my mind's eye. It's so good. It's gonna be triumphant. I feel like the first shows back, people are gonna be sobbing. Oh yeah. Oh. I don't, not at our shows because I don't think we'll be among the first shows back. But um, yeah, it's gonna be emotional for people. Uh, speaking of sobbing, yeah, it's funny. We actually have one of our coworkers at the uh, Cascadia show at Bose that, that last October 2019. Uh, sh- she's a huge fan, and she'll be a sad oh, head as well. But she cried the whole time. Like her boyfriend looked over like a couple of songs in and was like, "What? Like what? Why are you crying? I just love them so much." And she pretty much bawled your entire show here at Bose last wow. time. So she's a guarantee to be crying front row next time. We'll point her out for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you'll you'll notice her. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. There is no replacement for live music in a room with a bunch of people. It's a shared experience that cannot be replaced by Zoom or facebook live or any of the platforms you can have the fanciest platform with the best production ever it's never the same so um as much as i sort of in the back of my head worry that people will have grown really accustomed to having their media brought to their laptop at all times um i i am very confident in the power of live music and i think that we're we're be okay we can for the next six to eight months here yeah, there's no question. They'll be uh, they'll be here when you get here. We can't wait to have you back in. 
Hell yeah. Can't wait to be there. Uh, anything else you want to say about um, the new song or Said the Whale in 2021? Oh, geez. Just um, just keep keep your eye on us. You know, we're going to be putting out a lot of music, a lot of content. Um, and, uh, and, and we're excited to, to be able to share it all. And I think it's going to be the beginning of a very good album cycle. And I'm very excited. So thank you to those who have eyes on already. And, uh, and if you don't, then um, go give us the follows on all the social media things. And hopefully we'll see you in the flesh sometime soon. Awesome. And we want to thank you. I mean, we're brand new to the podcasting world. So to take a chance on a, a podcast you'd probably never heard of before. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time and sharing. They said bows and I was all in, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, next time, I mean, when things clear up and you guys are actually in town, we'd love to have you in the studio again and have another yeah, chat. That'd be great. You're a good conversation, Thanks. man. So thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Likewise, great chats and, um, keep safe out there and we will see you in real life so soon. Sounds good, man. Awesome. Best of luck. Thanks, Tyler. All right, guys. Take care. Peace. There you have it, episode one, The Road the Stage. Wow. I don't honestly don't think we could have asked for uh, a better person, a better band to start The Road the Stage with than Tyler Bancroft. Yeah, so follow Said the Whale everywhere you can, and please, please make sure you check out their new single, Honey Lungs, and especially the lyrics. Very, very meaningful. I, like I said during the show, like I, just the band is so positive uh, and it's amazing and needed right now. And the other thing, too, is to make sure to check out their Patreon. Yeah. Become a said head. Like, sure, join all the groups, but get that Patreon. It was surprising to hear Tyler say that they were hesitant to do it. They didn't like having the handout, and I get it. Um, but at the same time, you get a whole lot of value from these guys. They're uber creative. Uh, check out the, the Patreon for sure. Be a said head, not a dead head. Just joking, <laughs> just joking, kind of. <laughs> So now what about for us? Like I'm an old guy, Patrick, like, is this the part where we say smash the subscribe button? Well, as someone who, I get to say that as someone who basically took the last five years off of social media. Yes. I think this is where you say like, follow, share, subscribe. Uh, yeah. All those things. Anywhere you can find us, please do that. And, uh, we've got new episodes every Wednesday, 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 Wednesday. Wednesday.